Um, for now, um, most of you said an energy source of some sort would be useful. And Earth has that, right? We have sunlight, um, liquid water. So a place for chemicals to mix. I guess maybe I could switch these two. What we want is a place for chemicals to mix. What we assume is that liquid water is the appropriate solvent for that to occur. Um, we would also like an atmosphere, as you mentioned, to help keep our temperature steady. Um, and when we think about other places in the solar system, some of our other planets do have atmospheres. Uh, some of you may have remembered this from 121. If not, go ahead and just guess which planets have atmospheres in our solar system. All right, so I'm seeing the most votes for B, that Venus and Mars are the planets with atmospheres. And that's exactly right. So um, Mercury and the moon do not have atmospheres. And this is part of what's responsible for their extreme uh, swings between daytime and nighttime temperature. Um, so both Mercury and the moon experience extreme fluctuations in surface temperature. Venus is a pretty balmy 800 degrees Fahrenheit all the time. And Mars also has a relatively large swing between daytime and nighttime. It does have an atmosphere though, uh, but it's quite a bit thinner than the atmospheres of either Venus or Earth. So Venus and the Mars have atmospheres. Um, and when we compare these to um, the Earth's atmosphere, uh, we notice there's a very big difference in, in the atmospheric pressure. So Venus, like I said, it has a very, very thick atmosphere. Mercury technically has some atmosphere. There's some, you know, particles that are within the atmospheric region, but the pressure there is very low. There just aren't very many molecules. Um, so the, the pressure of them um, running into each other is very low. Mars has a fairly low pressure as well compared to Earth's atmosphere. So Mars has an atmosphere of six millibars, Earth around 1,000 millibars, and Venus around 93,000. So you can see there's a big difference in the types of atmospheres that bodies could have, right? So just finding that there exists an atmosphere is not necessarily enough. It's important to know how much atmosphere there is and what it's composed of. Okay. Anyway, the presence of an atmosphere in general does keep the temperature steady compared to places that don't have an atmosphere. And if there happens to be ozone in the atmosphere, like in Earth's atmosphere, that can also protect the uh, object from UV radiation, which is helpful. So what is the overall reason that our atmosphere protects us from UV? So I see some votes for greenhouse gases, some for oxygen, some for water vapor. And let me end the poll here. So what I was after was oxygen in specifically the form of ozone. Um, and I wanna dive in a little bit here on greenhouse gases because there are lots of different atmosphere, atmospheric gases, right? There's water vapor, so that's H2O. There's oxygen, which is O2, that's the kind we breathe. There's carbon dioxide, CO2. And there's, I guess, nitrogen mostly, N2. Um, ozone is O3. And let's see, what else do I wanna mention? Methane, NH4, no, CH4. Okay, so of these, um, some of these are greenhouse gases and some of them are not. The ones that are greenhouse gases, give me a color here. So CO2 is a greenhouse gas, um, water vapor is a greenhouse gas, and methane is a greenhouse gas. Um, you'll notice that all of these have at least three um, atoms in the molecule, right? And so the thing about greenhouse gases, the reason that they absorb um, infrared radiation is because they happen to be able to vibrate in a way that absorbs the radiation uh, and then re-emits it back toward Earth. And so it turns out that you have to have um, molecules made of at least three atoms to achieve this. So the other um, gases in our atmosphere that don't contribute to the greenhouse effect are the oxygen, the nitrogen, and the ozone. But the ozone is helpful because it does react with UV radiation. And so that's the reason the ozone protects us from um, UV. All right, so 
that's just, I guess, a crash course on greenhouse gases versus other gases in our atmosphere, in case you're not familiar, which I don't expect you to be familiar. Um, what questions do you have about these kind of atmospheric components? All right, so oxygen is the component of ozone in the atmosphere that protects us. All right, um, our last factor for habitability um, that I think someone came up with was a magnetic field. It's helpful because it helps to shield us from the solar wind. These are charged particles that are emitted from the sun and they get trapped in the Earth's magnetic field and funneled toward the polar regions where they create the aurora borealis and aurora australis. Um, but otherwise, those solar wind particles are moving at high speeds and they're charged particles so they can be damaging. So it's nice to have a magnetic field to shield us from those high speed charged particles. Oh, okay. I do see a question in the chat. Where did all the nitrogen come from? So there, the nitrogen was part of our primary atmosphere. Um, and even, so the table I showed you before from primary to secondary is a percentage. So the oxygen increased and other items in the atmosphere decreased. So the share of nitrogen became relatively large compared to other things, but it wasn't created by life. It was already here. Okay. So I wanna come back to our definition of life before we move on with habitability and looking for life. And we've decided that life is something that eats, grows, reproduces, and evolves. Um, but if we think about those criteria and try to map them onto these four habitability criteria, um, let's see if we can make some one-to-one -one pairings. So which of these um, elements of life does an energy source support? Okay. I see the most votes for eating, but also some votes for growing, which I think is a reasonable point. So you have to be able to um, use that energy for something, right? So maybe A and B are both kind of fair answers. I had in mind eating. So an energy source is basically our form of fuel, right? Um, but we use that fuel for something and usually we use that fuel for growing. So I think that's a reasonable answer as well. Um, what about liquid water? What of the um, life criteria does that support? Yeah, so this one's even harder to answer than the first one, right? I'm seeing some votes for evolving, but also some for growing and reproducing. Um, I guess I had in mind evolving, given that we think that the primordial soup is sort of the you know, place where life first emerged. Um, so a place for chemical reactions is helpful for that reason. Um, but I, I could also see the argument that you would like to have uh, liquid water in order to support these other functions, right? It's essential to have a, some sort of solvent no matter where your chemistry is taking place, whether it's you know in cells in the ocean or in cells somewhere else, there's still water involved. Um, okay, what about an atmosphere? So let me relaunch the poll. All right, I see growing and reproducing. I would argue that really it's helpful for all of these things, right? This is sort of a condition that's not really supportive of one particular part of life, but actually it protects life so that all of these functions are possible. And what about the magnetic field? I'm gonna assume the E is for all of the above. Uh, I would, I would agree. E is all of the above. Yeah, the magnetic field, just like the atmosphere, is also something that basically protects life so that it can carry out all these other functions. So really, when we consider habitability, um, finding you know protective factors is good. But there are some factors that are basically non-negotiable. You need some kind of energy source. Otherwise, you definitely can't have life. And uh, we assume you need liquid water as a place for chemicals to mix. Otherwise, you can't have life. So those two are, I would argue, probably the most important factors to look for in terms of habitability, uh, but they might not be the easiest to look for depending on what you know, detection techniques we have. So we'll talk about that next time. Um, but coming back to our definition of life, we think it's fairly straightforward, right? That life eat, grows, reproduces, and evolves, but it's not exactly that simple. 
So I'm not going to read this to you. Uh, you can read it on your own. But essentially, there's no specific definition that everyone agrees on about what life is. And all the exceptions that you came up, like the ones uh, you mentioned, things that can't reproduce necessarily. Are they alive? What about things that are dead? Well, they used to be alive. So do you define them as non-living? Um, individuals don't evolve. So specifically looking for changes within individuals can't really help you to pinpoint whether something is life. It's not the kind of definition that is easy to pin down. It's something that is more like, you know, it when you see it. So um, I, I, I want to just read this last part of the quote to you. Perhaps finding extraterrestrial life will be more like falling in love than confirming a scientific hypothesis. When it happens, we'll know. So with that in mind, we can look toward what we might want to look for. What kind of other questions would we like to ask to better guess which of these life criteria is universal? So one of the questions we have is, is all life carbon-based? So we know that life as we know it is carbon-based, but do all organisms have to be carbon-based? Um, well, we know that carbon is a reasonably useful molecule for structuring life around because it forms many bonds. So it can form very complex molecules leading to things like amino acids and proteins and DNA and all that fun stuff. Um, but silicon also forms four bonds. It has a very similar chemical structure in that way. And it forms only at the end of very massive stars lives. Um, there's a lot more silicon in Earth's crust than there is carbon, but life still manages to be carbon-based on Earth. So there are people that argue that silicon-based life forms are theoretically possible, um, and it simply just didn't happen here. Instead, life here emerged around carbon. Um, one reason we think that that might not be as easy for life to form around silicon is that the bonds that it makes are a lot stiffer and so they might be more prone to breakage. When we see silicon in um, you know, solid forms on Earth, it tends to be very stiff. Um, so it's not necessarily as flexible as carbon is for, for creating lots of different types of molecules. OK, so we assume that most life is going to be carbon-based for those reasons. Um, another question that we could ask is, are there other energy sources? So we use sunlight here on Earth, right, for photosynthesis, but that's not the only possible source of energy. Um, you could also have energy from the interior of a planet, let's say heat from tidal heating. So I want to just briefly talk about this, uh, which will explain to you why some uh, moons have oceans under their surface. So this is Jupiter. And this one is, I don't know, that looks like Callisto to me, but I could be wrong. It's a moon of Jupiter. And the idea with tidal heating is that there are uh, different forces from gravity on the near side of the planet and on the far side of the planet on the moon. So Jupiter pulls more strongly on the near side than on the far side of its moon. And that elongates um, the moon slightly. And as it moves around in its orbit, it experiences a different differential force on either side. And that difference is greatest at the uh, nearest approach, right? So as a result, the moon stretches more and less as it orbits Jupiter. And as a result, this friction essentially creates heat. So um, the interior of these moons, which are covered in ice, are warm. And we know that they're warm for various reasons. We covered it in 121. Um, but we think that many of the moons of Jupiter and Saturn that have ice on their surfaces have liquid water underneath the ice. And a lot of times we think this liquid water is probably salty because it generates a magnetic field. So um, it's totally possible that life could exist on the moons of those planets because they do have an energy source and they do have liquid water. All right, um, I'll give you some examples. We'll go into more depth next time, but Europa has lots of cracks on its surface. So it's an icy surface, but all of these cracks indicate that the ice is a shell that's moving around on top of a liquid ocean. 
if it didn't have cracks, then we would assume that, you know, there wasn't any motion underneath that could drive those changes in the crust. Um, Ganymede here, uh, we actually have measured its magnetic field. And so we know that there's probably salt water under its ice. Um, but it, you can see it has a lot less cracks and more craters. So it's a less fresh surface. Um, so it might not be as um, active as Europa. And then some moons of Saturn that are interesting to explore. Enceladus has an underground ocean. We know that directly because it's freaking spouting its ocean into space through these um, hydrothermal vents. There are cracks in the surface and we've actually measured some of the um, composition of what's coming out. And it does have some uh, simple amino acids as well. And then we've got Titan. Um, it looks boring here, but it has a surface with hydrocarbon lakes. Uh, it has a very thick and hazy atmosphere, similar to Venus, except for it's mostly made of um, heavier hydrocarbons. And we know that Titan is geologically active. So there's lots of interesting stuff to explore in the outer worlds. So um, one more question we might ask about life is, how sensitive is it to the specifics of our environment, right? How important is our environment to sustaining life? And by that, I mean the one that we are used to. Um, and this, you know, kind of looking at extremophiles on Earth shows us that life can persist uh, in some very extreme places. So an example is superheated vents deep in the ocean where the temperature is actually above the boiling point of water, but because there's so much pressure, it's the water's not actually boiling. So life can exist in this environment. Um, there are highly acidic environments that life thrives in as well as very, very salty places. So life can hang on in extremes, though I would say that none of these places are friendly to human life, right? So these extremophiles, um, they show us that life can exist in a multitude of places. And so when we look for life elsewhere in our solar system or elsewhere in the universe in general, we should be mindful of these things, that the conditions that we think are friendly to life as we know it, life, you know, human life, are not the sorts of environments that will necessarily um, be, you know, necessarily inhabited by the most common types of life. Okay. Um, hmm. Shouldn't have, my animations broke. So in the activity, we brought up this idea, the assumption of mediocrity, right? So if life on earth only depends on essentially amino acids to form the proteins, and nucleotides to form the genetic material. And if those basic molecules um, can be easily produced on you know, most planetary surfaces or deep within the oceans of uh, icy worlds. And if, those, if you know, many stars can form these molecules and if the same basic laws of science apply everywhere, then life should be fairly common. Given enough time, there should be life elsewhere. So the question is, where is everyone? And why haven't they said hi to us yet? Um, so this is the question we'll come back to next time. Um, we'll talk about the Fermi paradox and about SETI and also look at how we might want to explore the solar system and seek life elsewhere. So I hope that today is a good warm up for all of those big ideas. Um,